Thank you, Juliet, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted to be here at this Cybers conference. My last visit, actually, is 15 years ago. It was in Atlanta, and it's great to see how this event has developed over in the meantime. It is, in my view, the undisputed flagship conference for transaction banking, a business which you all know is at the heart of our new strategy. So it is absolutely fitting that I'm back at Cybers less than 10 weeks after we announced Deutsche Bank's largest restructuring in a whole generation. One of the main pillars of our July restructuring was to put our key clients back at the center of Deutsche Bank. And within the newly created corporate bank division, transaction banking is an area where we are very excited about, both with regard to our corporate, but also, and in particular, our financial institution clients. Building on a strong 2018, revenues at the 10 largest transaction banks continue to grow in the first six months of this year to top $15 billion. So it's an expanding business, and we already have a leading position to build on. So being here today to update you on Deutsche Bank's progress and discuss the future of our industry is a privilege and a strategic priority, which is why I'm very happy to be at Cybos 2019. But why is the transaction banking so critical for us? Well, in the current environment, a waterproof and stable business max is paramount. This was one of the major reasons why we decided to restructure our bank in July. So what is on my mind when thinking about the macro environment? I'm particularly worried about a series of financial and geopolitical risks, ranging from the situation in Hong Kong to the latest tension in the Middle East. These risks create an extraordinary macroeconomic situation that is very hard and difficult to predict and potentially making this whole thing even more volatile. Globally, the erratic trade war between the US and China remains the key element of uncertainty weighing on growth. The dispute has escalated beyond our expectation with tariffs between the US and China up from 3 to 5% on average to 21 to 23%. This turns the improvements for free trade during the past decade upside down. Higher prices result in slower growth by making business investment and household consumption more expensive, which concerns overall the economic direction of the conflict, and we're seeing an adverse effect on business sentiment and investments. While the overall picture still looks okayish, the adverse impact is starting to materialize. Official growth figures for China are still above 6%, and most 2019 and 2020 forecasts are only slightly lower. However, when attending the Singapore summit last week, a real inspiring business conference, I also heard economists debating that according to some of their models, China's growth could be significantly below 6%. And whatever the best metrics may be, this slowdown is worrying given China's importance as a key driver of global growth in the recent past. And we should not expect the US-China conflict to disappear anytime soon. This is more than just about trade flows and tariffs. The two largest economies in the world are engaged in a structural conflict about economic and political dominance. So the associated uncertainty is to persist as well. All of this is unsettling for entrepreneurs, for investors, and also for consumers. And while the world economy looked robust for some time, these risk factors have started to bite. In its most recent World Economic Report, the International Monetary Fund blames these geopolitical uncertainties for 2019, GDP figures that point to weaker than anticipated global activity. Especially for Europe, the sky has darkened. The most obvious proof is my home country, Germany. After a decade of growth, the economy is expected to shrink for the second quarter in a row. Other European countries will suffer as well. And this comes at a time when many structural issues in the Eurozone have not been solved over the last decade, despite 
a tailwind from extremely low interest rates. Italy's debt level is just the most prominent example, but not the only one. Listing risk factors, I have not mentioned Brexit yet. But as we are in London, and things are still moving so quickly, honestly, I think I'll leave this for our conversation over coffee. In this scenario, with plenty of uncertainty, what is really worrying is that the central banks have used their tools to a large extent already. So there are no conventional measures left to effectively cushion a real economic crisis. They have already turned on the money tap to the limit. First and foremost, the European Central Bank, which has now announced an even looser monetary policy. But ladies and gentlemen, very few economists believe that cheaper money at this level will have any effect, something our clients actually absolutely reinforce. All, and I tell you all, SME tell me, they will not invest an additional euro just because the loan will be an additional 10 basis points cheaper. Hence, while we probably won't see the positive effects, there are lots of negative ones, like the distortion of asset prices, the continued redistribution of wealth in favor of the asset-owning affluent, and the social implications these things aggregate. But the business cycle is only one of the challenges for economic policy, arguably the less complicated one. The long-term challenge is that the global balance of power is clearly shifting. The race between the US and China is in full swing about trade, but especially over technology. This, falls, <clears throat> this fallout means Europe risks losing further ground if we do not seize the opportunity offered by digitization. Deutsche Bank economists, as well as, for instance, McKinsey economists, expect an enormous first mover advantage in technology. They actually estimate it will be worth at least about $15 trillion over the next five years. This gain will accrue mainly to the US and China and not to Europe. This view is supported by anecdotal evidence. During my meetings and sessions in Asia last week, America and China were the hot topics of conversation also when it comes to long-term growth. Europe was much less of an issue. We simply aren't that interesting anymore for many investors and companies. And we must be alarmed that Norway's sovereign wealth fund, the largest in the world, is considering switching large amounts of money into US equities because the growth prospects there are so much better than in Europe. All of this demonstrates that if we don't want to lose our relevance, we have to act fast but also decisively. So how can we become more competitive? And let me briefly share what I see as the five main key priorities for Europe. First, we need finally more Europe. We need a single European market that deserves this name. In the past decade, European countries, including Germany, have flourished during a golden age of booming exports to the rest of the world, including to Asia and in particular to China. This model will not work forever, not only because of lower growth rates in those markets, but also because China will produce more and more goods on the ground and become less dependent on imports. This week, the Financial Times reported that the Chinese government is pressuring airlines to buy more aircraft from domestic manufacturers. And I can tell you a lot of examples from other industries. It requires a real single market, not a collection of 27 or 28 separate markets with different regulation, insolvency schemes, and labor laws. Second, Europe needs to become a more attractive business location. There is a global trend to lower corporate taxes, which we have to address. Just one example from my home country. In Germany, corporate taxes are eight percentage points above the OECD average. That's, in the long term, simply not sustainable. Becoming more competitive includes encouraging our competition authorities to widen their perspective beyond the European market. We need to ask ourselves, is it really in Europe's best interest to ban the merger between two leading train manufacturers as it happened earlier this year? Third, Europe must become more attractive again for the best talents. We have enough bright minds in Europe, which we have not been good 
at deploying, but good at exporting them. We must do more to ensure that they do not migrate into Silicon Valley or other tech centers in this world, but that they add value to our economy. This requires European companies to be attractive employers for these talents, but it also requires corresponding conditions, including remuneration. While it is a common practice at US startups and tech companies to include stock options in a compensation package, it is very difficult in certain European countries, including Germany, due to unfavorable regulation. Fourth, Europe needs to invest more, in particular in technology, digitization, and related infrastructure. This is especially true in the current phase of the business cycle when growth is slowing down and governance spending may help to stabilize the situation. We need much better research centers, far better education, and better data networks to underpin expansion into the internet, internet of things, artificial intelligence, and robotics. Just to put things into perspective, the German federal government has announced 3 billion euros of investments into artificial intelligence by 2025. 3 billion. But the Chinese cities of Shanghai and Tijiang are planning artificial investments of almost 15 billion. Let me clarify, 15 billion each. And the US tech giants are also investing heavily in this area. And fifth, we need to take a look inwards at our own attitude towards the technological disruption that is already reshaping the global economy. And what I mean, Europe should therefore not focus primarily on regulating new technology. Europe should drive innovation itself. This is crucial because the competition for technological supremacy will determine the future division of global economic power, and thus also determines Europe's position in the world going forward. And ladies and gentlemen, the financial sector must also make its contribution. There is no doubt. Among other things, by financing companies, arranging their payments, or providing access to the capital markets. And Deutsche Bank is proudly doing all of this and far more. But to achieve our aims and serve our clients against the backdrop of global macroeconomic risks, low interest rates, and a fragmenting Europe, we must make ourselves weatherproof. A stable structure for a bank has never been more important than right now. For the first 15 months since my appointment as CEO in April 2018, up to our strategy announcement in July this year, we only concentrating on stabilizing the bank, and that was success. In 2018, we finally substantially reduced our costs and were profitable again for the first time in three years. We also further strengthened our capital ratios and have one of the cleanest balance sheet since I've been working in this bank, and that is now 30 years. And we significantly improved our controls and worked further to meet regulatory requirements. The fact that we passed the CICA stress test in the US for the first time demonstrate the progress we have made. And there's more progress to come. Building this solid foundation was critical to regain trust, but also credibility. So in July, we were ready to announce phase two of reshaping our bank. Now, our focus is on stabilizing earnings and laying the foundation for new growth. We are keeping the best parts of our heritage as a risk manager, but also trusted advisor. And we are making them the backbone of a radical transformation that will play to our strengths. This means divesting certain business areas, such as equity sales and trading. Of course, that means we are losing some revenues in the short term. But it also means we free up resources in order to invest where we are strong. First and foremost, in our corporate business with the transaction bank at its core. The reactions to our new strategy have been consistently positive, with a great deal of encouragement from clients in particular. Nobody actually questions that we are going into the right direction. Rather, and that is fair, we are asked whether we can actually implement our plans within the timeline. And here I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we are already in the middle of it, and that two and a half months after announcement. We have closed our cash equity trading business and have completed the first auction of our equity derivative portfolios. And just two days ago, 
we announced the binding agreement with BNP Paribas regarding our prime finance and electronic equities business. With this new strategy, we see ourselves prepared for an economic downturn. We will strengthen our more stable business, which will contribute more than 70% of our group revenues in future. We have, <clears throat> we have chosen certain areas to invest in because they are the ones where we have depths of knowledge, the client base, the scale, the competitive advantage, and therefore the strongest growth prospects. But it's not only what we do, we will also materially change the way we work. Four priorities are crucial to build a better Deutsche Bank for all our stakeholders. First and most important, we have to change from a product-led organization to a client-centric one. We finally need to put the client in the center of everything what we do. We also need to become entrepreneurial to be an attractive employer for the best talents. We have to be decisive. We need to be technology-driven, and we need to fully embrace sustainability, not just with a climate-neutral headquarter in Frankfurt and good policies, but also with what we can do for our clients as a product offering. And one of the best examples of how we can achieve these new objectives is actually our newly created corporate bank. It combines a strong focus on clients with an innovation-driven business model. This corporate bank, as I said, is the heart of our new Deutsche Bank, which builds around transaction bank, which serves corporates and financial institutions equally. We combine this with our commercial clients in Europe and in Germany. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, we simply want to be Europe's leading corporate bank with a global network in more than 60 countries. So for Deutsche Bank, it's a stable business and absolutely essential for corporates and institutions. And as we move towards a more uncertain macro environment, transaction banking will remain indispensable as the backbone of the world economy. Whichever way the economy will turn, corporates and institutions will need transaction banking, which is the means by which trillions of dollar settlements will travel. Putting the corporate bank at the heart of Deutsche Bank means maintaining a deep understanding of a client's business model, processes, and how these things are developing. Simply put, we are relevant and our clients need us. Some might have said transaction banking was not the most exciting business. In fact, if you really deep dive into this, the opposite is the case. And this today more than ever before. I'm excited about the dynamics which we have seen in this sector in recent years, and I'm sure we are just seeing the beginning. Whether it's a technological disruption, regulatory developments, or new players entering the market and challenging existing business model, these are critical times for all of us. To give the best advice, we must also be expert and thought leaders on the dynamics of our business, starting with the essence of transaction banking, which is payments. As more and more industries move to an always-on approach, our client requirements are becoming ever more sophisticated and demanding. Frictionless, real-time payments is influencing consumer choices at the end of the day. For instance, when choosing a taxi-hailing app, one factor will be whether the app interfaces with any existing digital wallets you have, and whether the payments are seamless in the background so you don't even have to think about that. Problems with payments at the end of a journey will simply dent a customer's overall experience, and this affects their brand loyalty heavily. So it's up to transaction banks to keep everything running smoothly behind the scenes. In simple words, we must be utterly reliable. Real-time payments are perhaps the most important positive development in our business, but they create challenges. For once, real-time payments need nothing else than real-time monitoring and it equates, it equates to real-time risk. Managing this effectively will require significant investments into technology. Not all banks will have the investment appetite to meet these requirements. Whether through standalone investments or partnerships, those who can deliver these solutions will enjoy compelling opportunities. Just one current example, Deutsche Bank is collaborating with a large-scale 
payment service provider, one of the household names in the world. They want to significantly develop the user experience of their payments platform. Instant execution is key to this. We are also building the infrastructure for the client to cover the SEPA region. The product will allow SEPA instant payments directly from the customer's wallet to their own or any other account, including a push notification from Deutsche Bank to the client. This is a great example of how we combine our product know-how and technological innovation with the client's expertise and the USP. These examples highlight another major trend, and that is the relegation of the traditional bank account. Current accounts remain relevant, but they have lost their monopoly on non-cash payments. While a credit card always had traditional accounts in the background, today's electronic wallets have the potential to replace a bank account for a certain target group, especially in many emerging or developing markets. That's a development banks have to deal with, and we are, by emphasizing innovation and recognizing the benefits of partnerships, especially with startups. And that's exactly why we are working with and bought actually a stake in US-based modal payments, an industry leader in digital payments innovation. The wallet payment specialist technology is helping us to extend payments into non-bank payment platforms such as Alipay, PayPal, and WeChat. And regulation is reshaping all areas of financial services, creating challenges, but also opening up new opportunities. The EU's Payment Service Directive, or PSD2, is the main driver towards open banking and is boosting competition, innovation, and transparency across the region. Although often perceived as a threat to traditional banks, PSD2 also brings new opportunities to them. This includes the option for transaction banks to move from the back end actually to the front end. Recently, we have started our cooperation with the International Air Transfer Association, YATA, to create YATA Pay, a new payment option that connects the customer's bank account directly to the airline. Since most flights are booked with credit cards, which means processing fees for airlines, YATA Pay can actually cut costs for the benefit of both airlines and their clients. So in seeding the opportunities from PSD2, Deutsche Bank has gone beyond a bank's usual role to become the payment initiation service provider acting as aggregator for payments. I will not ignore that transaction banks are facing increasing competition. PSD2 has also acted as a catalyst for platform business models, which includes those moving aggressively into financial services. Names like Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Alipay, with their vast potential client base, market capitalization, and data analytics capabilities are already taking market share from banks, not only in the retail area. At the other end of the scale, nimble but highly innovative fintechs are focusing on niche areas of transaction banking, and they are challenging incumbents. Nevertheless, banks, supported by their superior reputation for security and long-term client relationships, are still in a very strong position to succeed in the platform economy also, and in particular, regarding payments. But we need to catch up in terms of utilizing our vast stores of client data. This is a priority for us at Deutsche Bank, as it is certainly for many of our peers. Looking ahead, I'm very optimistic for the transaction business globally. We see growing markets, in particular, in the Asia-Pacific region. The clients I met there last week reinforced my confidence that we have major opportunities in that region, and transaction banking plays a crucial role to capture them. However, not all transaction banks will follow the same business model. All must grapple with some key questions, including when do I go alone? And when do I seek to partner with another bank, group of banks, or a startup like Modo? The answer is often a mixture. With regard to blockchain technology, it makes sense to work in industry groups like the Interbank Information Network, which we actually joined last week. 
As a group of more than 300 banks, we are collaborating to improve the process of investigating missing or failed payments. We know industry groups can be extremely effective, such as our active participation in SWIFT, which together with the banking industry has transformed cross-border payments. There are many more outstanding issues, and I'm convinced that as an industry, we should have more willingness to collaborate. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've provided some explanation into Deutsche Bank's view on the global economy, the shape of our transaction bank, as well as some insights into the changing face of our industry. As a traditional bank, we must build on our core strengths, trust, long-term client relationships, and security. But at the same time, we need to deeply innovate to stay relevant. In payments, in customer apps, in deploying artificial intelligence, in building or facilitating European alternatives to American and Chinese platforms, and more. Payments and financial transactions will continue to evolve and diversify. But corporates and institutions will still need a partner capable of bundling all these diverse financial flows and to navigate them through a complex but exciting future, but in a very difficult economic environment. And hence, banks like us are in a great position to be and remain the trusted partner. We still retain the majority of consumer accounts across the spectrum of financial services. Change is coming, but if we embrace technology, if we retain the new talents, work together and keep clients at the center of everything we do, I'm absolutely convinced transaction banks will have a bright future, and I'm absolutely convinced we talk next year at Cybos 2020. Thank you very much, and enjoy your day.